All right, lesson five, just to be remember, reminded of 1 Peter 3, 15. As the apostle says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense or an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. A lot is said there, we don't have time to preach it, but it's important that we set the Lord apart in our hearts, every Christian to do that, and that we prepare ourselves by studying and studying and studying and growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord so that we will be always ready to give a defense to those that we encounter in this world, a reason for the hope that is in us, and the way we do that with meekness, with humility, and with fear. As we read in Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Again, it matters how we express things and word things to others. We want to be as effective as we can in our efforts to uh, share the gospel with the lost around us. Okay, so the first error that we're addressing this evening is sprinkling or pouring is sufficient for baptism. How would you answer that if you're talking to someone who has been taught this error, maybe has received it as their form of baptism, that they had water sprinkled or poured on them, whether that was when they were an infant, and of course they would have to be told that's what happened to them because they wouldn't remember, or they were older because sometimes that's a practice even done on grown-ups, on adults. How would you answer that? Okay. Well, the Bible describes baptism as a, as a burial, and I reference uh, Romans 6, verse 4, also I think Colossians 2, verse 12, yes. Uh, okay. yeah. so and so, that'd be one answer. so, obviously every time we, when we give an answer, we want to give it a Bible answer, right? We don't want to just throw out words and say, well, this is what we teach. <laughs> no, this is what our, our church teach. No. Let's look at what the Bible says, and we can go to Romans 6, verse 4. We can go to Colossians 2, 12, and many other scriptures, but here specifically in these two passages, how does Paul describe being baptized? He describes it as what? He describes it, the action or the mode of baptism as a person being buried, right? A burial. And... Of course, when we, we talk about the element, we know that the element to be used is water. Think about who? Conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. When Philip preached Jesus to him, from beginning at Isaiah 53, the very next verse, verse 36, says they came to some water, and when he saw the water, he says what? What hinders me? See, here is water. See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And of course, there's a lot of passages that connect baptism with the element of water. Now that we know it's with the water, the action described is a burial. Jeff? Uh, you talked about a little bit when you died. Just the, the realism that baptism is a transliteration, not a translation. And if it was truly translated, it would say immersion, right? And so it would, if you translate it, and in the reason it was transliterated was because of the doctrine that was in place during the King James era, era that it would have gone against the Anglican Church or one of the islands, whichever one it was, that was, was, was popular during that, at that time. But that, so it was transliterated. Uh, Keep the translators out of trouble, in a sense, because if you translated it, and because you, you think about it, it would make a huge difference if it was translated. And people, especially like the Ethiopian, he would say, "What, what hindered me from being immersed?" Right? If it was truly translated, and that would surely bring a different view of it. You would think, at least, to people. So I understand what the point Jeff's making here. So the word baptism is what's called a transliteration instead of a translation of the word. So the New Testament is written in Koine Greek to be specific. That's the specific Greek. But anyways, Old Testament, Hebrew, and Aramaic, New Testament is Greek. And normally you have a translation from the Greek into whatever language, in our case, English. 
But with the word baptism, those who, the scholars who did that transliterated it. So you take the Greek word and then put it and just straight transliterate it, baptisma. If you translated it, as Jeff is saying, then it would read immersion, okay, or a burial. Um, and that's the, that would be the literal way to translate the word, which, as he's indicated, makes sense. Wouldn't that take away a lot of the confusion or in the, maybe the religious error that we're having to address with sprinkler or pouring if it was just, it says immersion there, right? But, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of sources to go to if, if we need to or point people to, um, to know the definition of the word baptism and, and what it literally means. Norm, did you raise your hand? Going with the translation, as opposed to the transliteration, removes this as kind of something that you have to, in your own mind, and if it's the way you're teaching it, you're teaching the translation, not the transliteration, and there isn't any confusion whatsoever. There isn't anything that you look at, like, this is what the word means, so that's what I'm going to translate it as. And you're using the translation, and not the transliteration. There is nothing that is unclear about any passage that has the transliteration in it. They all become absolutely clear, and there's no question in anybody's mind as to what is being meant if you actually translate it. I think it was something that I hadn't considered until Ron Daly brought that up in his lesson, that by using the translation, as opposed to the transliteration, which is, that's a tradition we use, because it's been in our Bibles that have been translated for us. Right. But if we were actually to take it upon ourselves to translate it, that would be far better for ourselves yeah. and how we discuss this and that it's always this means immersion wherever i say this word it means immersion it means to immerse there's no confusion as to what that is right. so <clears throat> that is that aside we we have passages such as this we have the conversion of the ethiopian and other passages that clearly demonstrate to us illustrate the mode of baptism and so here in romans 6 4 therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. Well, you, you never seen someone have, um, who was being buried and have dirt just sprinkled or poured on top of them. Buried is to be covered. And that's, that's how baptism is described here. Baptism, uh, buried with him through baptism and death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And then in Colossians 2.12, buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Okay, was another hand that went up, Norm? Yeah, I was going to say, from the translation standpoint, there's only two ways that this word was, was translated. <coughs> one, the, the majority of the times it was immersion. There's only one other way, and that was for hand washing. And the Catholics try to use uh, the hand washing alternative as a way of trying to dismiss the true uh, translation of the word, which is for the, the immersion of it. But again, they lose out on, the, on that because they could say, well, it could mean hand washing, but then from that standpoint, in the context, you know, they like these guys, the Ethiopian eunuch, they didn't wash their hands, obviously from the context was not, was not what was going on there. So it's just kind of a, a straw man that they throw out there. So we get to Acts 8, they referenced it. But when he said that, Philip's response was, you, you, if you, you may, if what? If you believe with all your heart, you may. And, so, and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he, the unit, commanded the chariot to, be, to stand still. And then what do we read next? Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. He baptized him. And then they came up out of the water. It's totally unnecessary to get all wet if you just need to reach down there and, and get a little water to sprinkle or pour on top of someone's head for baptism. But totally necessary when we understand it's immersion, it's a burial. And so, yeah, you have to have enough water to go down into, baptize, and come up out of. Question one, why was John baptized in Anan near Salem, John 3.23? That's right. So, as Shirley said, the text says, and here's the actual words, because, the reason's given, there was much water there, All right? And so, do you see any significance in that? Well, yes, of course. You, you need enough water to immerse someone, right? To cover them. Not, you, don't, you don't need much water 
do you? You don't need much water, and this is plenty to do some sprinkling or pouring with in my about half-filled water bottle up here. Okay. Number two, what about a man on a deathbed? Would it be okay to just sprinkle or pour a little water over him in place of immersing him? Why or why not? Okay. Well, they're on their deathbed and, you know, the, the emotional argument would be used. I mean, are you going to say that this man's lost if he's not baptized? I mean, he obviously, you know, he believes in Jesus. Even he has faith. He, he, he's, he's willing to repent. And so that emotional argument, I mean, there's no condition to, uh, he's about to die here, to put under water and that sort of thing. And I've been in those situations, and maybe you have before too. I think I told the story before when uh, we were, lit, well, obviously April's living in Florida, that's where she grew up. But when I came there and started preaching, uh, there was a man who, had, who was dying of cancer, able to share the gospel with him, but he was bedridden. And so we took a van and laid it, laid it down and... Uh, about four or five of us men carried him, put him in the van, and transported him to the to the building where the baptistry was. And about four or five of us helped baptize him, lower him, and all that. And uh, it can be done. And I've I've heard of many other true life stories where someone's been taught the gospel and they've been convicted like the eunuch, and they see water and they or they need to get to water because they realize they need to be immersed or baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. And so, of course, no, it's not all right because. Uh, sprinkling and pouring is, is not what the Lord commanded. Uh, he who believes and is baptized, or he who believes and is immersed, would be the translation of Mark 16, 16. And so it's what Christ and the apostles commanded and taught and what was practiced as we see in the New Testament. Because we find no New Testament examples of folks having water sprinkled or poured on them, Right? Number three, explain how baptism is a form of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ from the text of Romans 6, 1 through 7, and verses 17 and 18. Okay, Gil? God would approve sprinkling. It would be easy for him to say, anoint someone with some water. I mean, they use that verbiage, another anointing with oil. I mean, they already have that. It would have been easy for him to say it. So he means what he says. He says what he means. Immersion. Yeah, well said. Yeah, if, if that's what God wanted and desired, it would be very clear in the, the uses of the verbiage, the text itself. As Gil said, you know, at times we read of people being anointed. Obviously, they weren't an, an, um, immersed in oil. But they, their head was anointed uh, with oil, uh, such as a king being appointed um, uh, to be a ruler over God's people or something of that nature. All right. Uh, so, question three. Isn't this a text, Jesse, you told me you liked before because it goes through those three things, death, burial, and resurrection. How is that, how is that brought out? How is that our baptism in connection with those three things with Christ? I, I was going to ask, I was asking Jesse, that's right. Well, that's what Romans 6 says, right, that, you know, if he died unto sin once, you get the idea of the imagery in, in Romans 6 as well, that, that you, the idea of dying to sin is, is represented, I think, in the, in the going down at the time of that burial, and then you're raised, you know, to walk in that newness of life as a new creature, as it's worded in, in other places. So, yeah. yeah. And so it says, buried with him through baptism into death. Well, obviously, we're not physically dying, right? We have spiritual death that needs to be addressed because we're dead in our trespasses and sins. And here in the text of Romans 6, it talks about uh, knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with. So we're putting to death in baptism uh, that body of, of sin uh, by the blood of Christ, buried, right, immersed, and, and then raised up like Christ was raised up. But we're raised up to, I think you just said it already, as the text says, to walk in newness of life at the end of verse 4 of Romans chapter 6. So it's kind of neat how our spiritual birth is, Paul connects it to Jesus' his death, his burial, his resurrection, uh, the likeness of it. Okay. Anything else you want to add to that? All right. Make, make quick, quick, please. Yeah, just that the, uh, the Catholics, for instance, they, uh, they do... They do accept uh, immersion as a form of baptism, 
It's just that they, uh, it, it's inconvenient for many of the, the false doctrines that they perpetuate out there, uh, including the, the last rites, which is a very big deal for a lot of, of different denominations, and especially the Catholic Church. And so uh, this one is a very emotional topic for them. So we really need to, when you, when you attack this with somebody, all the stuff we're talking about is, is very important because they're going to be emotionally tied to it. Right. And I can't remember what religious group or denomination it was, but years ago I remember reading maybe from their website or a book that uh, of theirs that they kind of gave all three kind of as, you know, as like a multiple choice, whatever you prefer, almost you know, sprinkling, pouring, immersion. Well, uh, the scriptures don't give us a multiple choice or leave it up to us to decide our preference when it comes to that. Um, there's things that certainly there's liberty in when it comes to God's word, but there's other things that, that certainly there's not, and this is one of them. All right, anything else before we move on? Okay, so the second religious error, the Lord's Supper may be observed any day of the week. Um, how do we answer this error? Why is that not true, not correct, to do it any day of the week? Excuse me, Ray? Okay, we read in the New Testament the scriptures that the first century Christians, they observed it on the first day of the week. Is that what you're going to say, Ken, Acts 20, verse 7. Okay. So in Acts 20 and verse 7. You know, something else that John Isaac points out is that, uh, you know, God has always been specific as to days. Um, in Leviticus uh, chapter 23, and we're not going to read it, but if you would look, look back at it, that will be helpful. Um, and if you have a Bible that has uh, little section headings, that will be even more helpful to you. But uh, in Luke 20, excuse me, Luke, Leviticus 23, uh, as I have at the top of my verses 1 and 2, it says the feast of the Lord, and then under that, verse 3 is the Sabbath, and then verses 4 through 8 is the Passover and le unleavened bread. And then verses 9 through 14, there's a little heading over that, the Feast of First Fruits. And then verses 15 through 22, over that section is the Feast of Weeks. And verses 23 through 25, uh, the Feast of Trumpets is over that. And then you got the Day of Atonement beginning in verse 26, and then beginning in verse 33, the Feast of Tabernacles. So, that, so this chapter is just filled with all these different feasts that the Lord appointed. But as you read through those, God is very specific and detailed when these were to be observed Obviously, the Sabbath was when? Well, that was weekly. Um, the rest of these listed were, were yearly. Uh, but a certain month of the year, a certain day of the year, um, of course, with the Passover and the unleavened bread, this was a longer feast that was observed uh, for seven days. But um, the, the, the Feast of Weeks... Uh, counting 50 days after the seventh Sabbath, what would that be? That would be Pentecost, okay? But, you know, God had given three of these as specific in the law of Moses where the men of Israel were to present themselves before the Lord where He had placed His name, which ultimately would be Jerusalem, of course. But um, that's important to know that when God has instituted a, a day, and guess, and of course, who instituted this? His son. And, you know, we, we go to Matthew 26 and Mark 14 and Luke 22 and, and those gospel accounts, uh, we read of when Jesus instituted. And when, when, when Paul is writing to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 11, what does he bring up? He brings up what I've received from the Lord, I deliver to you on the same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it. And he repeats what the Lord had instituted and that they are to continue to do it um, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And so, again, when God gives a day to be observed, uh, it is to be observed when he's uh, stated it to uh, be observed. And we already mentioned um, Ray and Ken 
you know, Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, by apostolic example. When we say apostolic, we have an apostle. We have Paul here coming to Troas, and Paul is not going to do something and take part in something in connection with the Lord's Supper or, or, or anything to deal with uh, in dealing with the Lord's church and worship that would be wrong to do. And so what do we read him doing? We read that uh, he's in Troas with the saints and upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, we read. And that's when they partook of it. And as we know, as we search the New Testament, we don't find any authority for the Lord's Supper to be observed on any other day. And we're told in multiple passages, um, you know, not to think beyond what is written. Well, what is written is the disciples partook of the Lord's Supper on the first of the week. That's when they broke the bread. And so we don't want to think beyond what we read. And we want to certainly remain in the teachings of Christ, not go beyond that, in 2 John 9, or in Revelation 22, 18 and 19, not add or take away from not only the book of Revelation, but any of God's Word. And, of course, we're under the New Covenant, and we don't want to take, add or take away anything from Christ's uh, covenant, uh, do we? And so, um, why do you think there, were, there are those, question one, on page 24, who would want to observe the Lord's Supper on a day other than the first day of the week? Why would they? I mean, it's done. It's pretty prevalent. Um, we've talked earlier, maybe the first class, but on the frequency of it. Uh, but this is more focused on just any day of the week. Uh, what do you think, Norm? For the, from the folks that I've talked to, the, the first thing they always go to is, uh, well, you know, good intentions on this. We, we, we want to make sure that, you know, we don't take it for granted and because we have to be, we want it to be special. And um, my, my response to that would be, it's supposed to be special every time. How often do you think about the Lord? You know, all of the, these things associated with that. So you can throw it back to uh, as, as far as uh, for me I look at for them as a spiritual weakness in not uh, being able to uh, conjure up a uh, good feeling about the Lord more than once a year or once a quarter or once a are any of you aware of uh, from personal knowledge experience or maybe your own religious background before learning the truth of a specific day of the week other than Sunday that you know that some partook of the Lord's Supper or whether they called the Eucharist or whatever they refer to it as, do you know of another day that it was taken? Daniel? Saturday. Saturday? Okay. So Saturday is a, is a big one, as they, as they call it, observing their, the Mass. Um, but I remember some years ago when I was preaching in Texas that there was a, a church of Christ that started doing that, offering it on a Saturday. And again, oftentimes the, uh, why that's the case, it's, think about a lot of things religiously or a lot of things in life. People want things that are what? Convenient. A lot of things is I want options. I want convenience. And so if it's more convenient for me to come maybe on a Saturday evening instead of the Sunday, then it's nice to have that option. It's more convenient for me this week or maybe always to do it that way, Jesse. At least to a first century Jew, I can understand them understanding that the first day of the week started on Saturday night. I can't speak to, again, anybody else's motives, but I could, I could see why they would approach it from that mindset. But Sunday a.m. still counts as first day of the week also. It wouldn't end till Sunday night at sundown if you were going to look at it that way. Right. And uh, I'm, you tempted me, but time-wise I don't want to 
jump into that because I know some would you will use Acts 20 to kind of argue that that point that you brought up. So it is good to, yeah, you're right. Personally, but you think about kind of the in general point that Paul makes in Second Timothy 4 about some who are going to depart from the faith is because they have what kind of ears. Itching ears, and it says they'll heap up teachers, but it, he says according to their own desires. And unfortunately, that what, that's what happens a lot in the religious world when it comes to error and error, error that's accepted or, or, or maybe an immorality in a person's life. Well, it's because they want to do it. It's, it, it, fit, it fits their fleshly desires. And uh, obviously, we must always guard against that. that. That has nothing to do with why we do something or or should want to do something that has to do with what God's will has revealed, that needs to be our, our desire. Our desires need to line up with his, his desire, what he's expressed in his revealed will to us, right? Okay, and then what is the, uh, let me see. Can you think of other days God has been, speci- has been specific about? We kind of touched on Leviticus 23. Do you think the Lord's people could observe these days just any time they wanted? No. Um, in fact, they came up with, uh, at times in their history, the Jews, uh, their own feast days and, and, and got called out on that. And um, you remember by the time of Christ, they had so many traditions. Uh, they were holding fast to their man-made traditions and laying aside God's actual commandments, right? And, and again, we see that uh, quite prevalent in our religious world today. Uh, what is the significance, real quick, of the first day of the week? We've mentioned this before, but... Okay, remember Jesus was raised from the dead on Sunday, the first day of the week, and the first gospel sermon was preached on the first day of the week. That was Pentecost in Acts 2, and Christians were commanded to, to give or take up a collection on the first day of the week. I don't think that's all just crazy coincidence, do you? And, and then the disciples came together in Troas to break bread on the first day of the week as well, so... There's a, a consistent uh, theme or thread there throughout the New Testament of a special emphasis on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. And the third era, uh, tithing is the scriptural method of gathering money. Okay. Why is this something that maybe is, you know, I left out, <laughs> I had to leave out 20 uh, to try to cover three and a quarter but this is one I wanted to include. Why do you think it's important for us to spend a little time talking about this? It's commanded a lot of times in denominations that you're supposed to tie. Okay, it's because it's something that goes on in many places still today. And so it's something we'll hear about at times, something we'll encounter um, in our relationships with others who come from uh, these denominational or community church backgrounds where they have been told by their preacher, pastor, uh, et cetera, that minister that they are, they need to tithe. Um, In fact, (laughs) I mean, I've encountered people that, you know, uh, they don't live any longer where their home congregation is, but they still are faithful in sending in their tithe. Okay. And this is what they've grown up hearing that, you know, we're commanded to tithe. Well, Yes, there was a command to tithe, but who was commanded to tithe? Tithing was an Old Testament commandment for Israel. And there's a lot of scriptures that mention tithing. We'll just note the one that John Isaac does in the book, Leviticus uh, chapter 27. If you'll turn there real quick. I've got about 10 minutes left. Leviticus 27. Did I do that? Yeah, I guess I didn't do my... I didn't do my custom animation because it's all coming up. Leviticus 27, 30 through 34. All right, who has that? Gil, you got that? The tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wants all, at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one fifth to it. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock or of whatever passes under the rod, The tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. And if he exchanges it 
at all, then both it and the one exchanged for it shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. Thank you. So it, it would not only be appropriate to tithe the day, it would be necessary to tithe the day as a child of God if we were a Jew under, under the law of Moses. But what happened to that first covenant? Well, it, yeah, let me go back already because it was already up. Um, it's been abolished. It's been done away with. Uh, Ephesians 2.15, um, Paul makes the point that the law of commandments contained in ordinances, which he refers to as that wall of separation that was causing hostility between Jews and Gentiles, that Christ, he abolished that in, his, in, the, in the flesh, the enmity that, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. He abolished it in his flesh. How did he abolish it in his flesh? What does that mean? He, he, it was done away with, abolished in his flesh. Because when he died, right? That's the point. When he died is when it was done away with. Because as Paul describes it in writing to the saints in Colossae, in Colossians 2.14, he said that Christ did what? Nailed it to the cross. Now, we know that he didn't carry up the law of Moses or the Ten Commandments and, and with him, uh, but figurative language, symbolic language that when he died, when he was nailed to the cross, the, uh, he also nailed the law of Moses. They were being put to death. Uh, or excuse me, the law of Moses was being put to death. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to uh, the cross. And then the Hebrews 8 passage, it refers to Jeremiah's prophecy. Jeremiah 31 God said way back in the days of the prophet Jeremiah that there was going to come a time when he would establish what? On the day, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, he says, with the house of Israel. And this new covenant is, is Christ is mediator of the better covenant established on better promises. That's verse 6. Verse 7 says, if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. If it met all of man's needs, mankind's, humankind's needs, there would be no reason for a second covenant, but it didn't. It was temporary. It had a purpose. It was fulfilled, and so it was done away with. Uh, and what was done away with, and, and that included the command to tithe. And so Paul says, he doesn't say to bind, bind tithing, but if you keep a part of the law of Moses, you become a debtor to keep all of it. So if you take tithing back here from the Old Testament law of Moses commanded to the Jews in that first covenant and say, well, you have to do that today, Paul says to us, you're under the curse. You've got to keep all things in the law. Notice in Galatians 3 and in verse uh, 10, Galatians 3 verse 10, okay, do you have that, Drew? Go ahead, please. For all who rely on the words of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do. Okay, notice that curse. Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You can't just take one thing, and they, of course, they were really emphasizing circumcision. You got to take, as we sometimes say, the whole answer law, you got to take everything with it. You can't just pick and choose what you want to, want to follow and, and bind. In chapter 5, in verses 3 and 4, Marissa, you have that? I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Okay, so here he brings up circumcision. And those who become circumcised, and of course, it's not, it wasn't wrong for a Jew to become circumcised, but he, he means in the context, you're doing that because you believe you have to do that in order to be saved. And, and he says, that's your basis. You're a debtor to keep the whole law. Of course, talking about the law of Moses here. And you've separated yourself from Christ. You've fallen from grace. And that's a very important point that we need to share with our friends and neighbors religious friends and neighbors, and it's not just tithing, it's other things that they carry over, instruments of music, and uh, some churches may be burning incense or a separate priesthood, etc. 
that they're taking things from the law of Moses has been nailed to the cross. You try to keep one thing, you got to keep everything. And, and obviously that, that's not being done anywhere. Uh, Norm? This is a great place to start for so many of the denominational errors that are out there because they, they want to run to the Old Testament as their first, as their first choice and say, yeah, God said it. And, uh, and if we can counter with this, then we can really get down into some some significant points and to uh, help them uh, to be persuaded. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Good point. So as John Isaac brings up in Roman, Roman numeral three on page 24, you know, if you're going back, going to go back to the Old Testament, keep the tithing command, you're a debtor to keep the whole law, offered your animal sacrifices, been to Jerusalem to worship. I mean, those are legitimate questions. That's not to, you know, that's not to, to mock or belittle or make fun of the people we're talking to, but just, you know, you word it in a way that is, is respectful, but gets the point across as you read these passages or they read these verses and say, you know, that means that you would have to offer animal sacrifices. You, is that what's done where you worship? Or do you know other churches that are doing that? And of course, no. Um, is anyone going to Jerusalem as command the law of Moses? No. To, to make to, On those feast days? No. Uh, well, that's necessary, Paul said, if you're going to take just a part of it. You've got to keep it all. Um, and under the law of Christ, I mean, excuse me, we're under the law of Christ. We're not under the law of Moses today. Galatians 6, 2 is one passage that mentions the law of Christ. And as we look at the, the teachings of the New Testament, yeah, we are commanded to give. That's, that's the common uh, link there. Were God's people commanded to give under the law of Moses? Yes. Are, are God's people today under, under the law of Christ, the New Testament, commanded to give? Yes. But when we're talking about tithing, this, and I didn't mention this, um, and we did a radio program on this, but tithing literally means what? 10%, that you're given 10% of what you have um, of your income. Now, would it be wrong for a Christian to give 10% of their income today? Not necessarily, right? But to bind it is what we're talking about. To, to say to the members, you have to, everyone has to tithe. Um, what do we read in the New Testament? What are the teachings uh, when it comes to giving? So we know it's... They were instructed to do it on the first of the week, as Paul says, I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 16, so you must also do. And he says, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as you may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. So what do we get from that? We get the day, but also we get a, an individual responsibility. Let each one of you lay something aside implies what? There's been some planning here. There's been some forethought. If I'm laying it aside, this is to give back to the Lord what he's blessed me with. And remember, the children of Israel, they were always commanded, take it off the top, not the bottom. The first fruits, that goes to the Lord. So we don't want to be reaching in our wallet or purse and well, let me see what, if I, what I have here left to give the Lord. No, that, that, what we give him should come first. And notice it's storing up as he may what? As he may prosper. Does everyone in this congregation prosper the same? No, not even, you know, there might be some that have similar incomes, I, I don't know. But we have people that are retired that no longer are working. We have those who are young people that just got their first job. We got those who have, are working at different companies, making a different salary or some getting paid hourly. God knows what we make and, and, and we do. And so we give as we have uh, prospered. And when you get to 2 Corinthians 9, 7, God also is, is concerned with what? Our attitude, right? We're to worship God in spirit and truth. And so don't give grudgingly of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So we're going to give different amounts. Is it wrong to give 10%? No. Is it wrong to give maybe, you know, as we're dealing percentages, something less than that, more than that? Of course not. Um, we need to give as we prosper. We need to give cheerfully, but we just must not bind tithing. All right, so those are the three. That's an easier night than uh, as I look down the road. One particular Wednesday is going to be really tough. But uh, anyways, thank you for your uh, comments tonight.